Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, so I brought this slide up just to remind everybody what we covered so far is um, here in Matthew 24. When will these things be? We covered that part of it and what will be the signs of your coming? Matthew 24, we, we did through verse 27 of what will be the sign of your coming. Now we're rolling into the second part of that question is um, end of the end of the age. So, if you have your Bibles, speaking of Bibles, yeah, yeah I know. I think I'll use my here with the expandable text. My vision's not getting any better with age, especially with uh, poor lighting. So, Matthew 24. Now, I'm going to pick up to what we didn't really cover last time. And that is the section. On, um, actually, you know, I could do it with these bits. Verse um, 28 reads kind of funny, right? And we kind of mentioned it, and there's different opinions on it, but we may as well take a look at it. So, when Jesus finishes answering the first part of that second question, um, what will be the sign of your coming? At the end of verse 28, he just kind of tags on there. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. And that's one of the verses you read and you say, what? My, uh, the NLP says, just as the gathering of the vultures shows there is a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. Mine says, or wherever the carcass is, the eagles will gather together. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, there's something gathering. <laughs> something's, something's a gathering. Something's a gathering tonight, that's for sure. So just kind of in, in brief, I mean, I, I tend to agree that with that idea of um, the New Living Translation, that's pretty good, but folks will dispute whether that's about vultures or eagles gathering. That could be about angels and all this other kind of stuff. So people come up with all kinds of different things. So um, that would be a fun verse to share, though, if somebody says, hey, what's your favorite verse in the Bible? And you read that, and you probably think, Yeah, you know, but it brings me hope, because then... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> She's planning it. Yes. Hmm. I actually picked up one in Chronicles, Second Chronicles, was it? At Parbar West, Westward, four at the Causeway, and two at Parbar, or something like that. And you think, what? Um... But anyway, pick a commentary. Many will conclude that vultures are Roman armies coming to pick over the corpses of the Jews, believe it or not. Matthew Henry takes a very general approach to what will happen uh, to the unbeliever. And Barnes insists it's a proverb similarly about Jerusalem. Some say the carcass is Christ. Pretty much everyone falls back on metaphor, almost. Um, but we find ourselves in keeping with the, the rules of interpretation addressed all along here and desirous of ever taking as direct a literal understanding as possible, wherever possible, unless there's some contextual precedence for doing otherwise. Um, let's see, MacArthur says in his notes, uh, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather, indicating that when he comes with his saints, he comes in judgments. Vultures are there to consume the flesh, 
a picture described, by the way, in the 19th chapter of Revelation. Remember that in Revelation? You can go there real quick and take a look, since he mentions it. Revelation what? 19. 19. Because Revelation 19 marks the very end of the tribulation period, the end of, end of the great tribulation, which means the. So we see the Lord coming in glory. So we've got the second coming here. Um, and look at this. Lo and behold, we were just discussing some of this here. Uh, in verse 3, um, they're saying, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. In verse 4, and the 24 elders and the four living creatures in heaven, they fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne, saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bond servants, you who fear him. Lauren's got her glasses on tonight. She's serious. She's on the ball. 21. She's got her good glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it says that birds will be filled with yeah. their flesh. Yeah. With their flesh. So, see? Buzzards. <laughs> exactly. So we got the beast in, in verse 19 and the kings of the earth and the armies that are assembled against them and so they get defeated, right? The beast is seized. In verse 20, and within the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive in the lake of fire which burns, burns with brimstone. I point out that they're the first tenants in the lake of fire. Nobody's in there yet. The lake of fire is prepared for the devil and his angels. But uh, these two don't, don't even get the benefit. The Antichrist and the false prophet don't even get the benefit of going through a trial first, like the great white throne judgment. They're just tossed right into the lake of fire, and they're, they're there. They're there for uh, a thousand years before Satan even gets there. And the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him, the sound of him, and all the birds were filled with their flesh, as Laura read. That fits right in with what Christ was saying. So that's a very direct, I think as literal as you can get, that matches exactly the second coming and how things wrap that up with that. And I, I think that's the most simple and direct way to do it. Um, so I'm not even going to... To me, I mean, this is this is really great book. This is really great book you can read. Whatever. Yeah. It's got more notes on it, but I think it's... Okay. I don't know, the author kind of seems like a wind. <laughs> the, author, full of himself. the author is a wind. It's full of something. <laughs> um, it's a full of coffee. Full of coffee. <laughs> full of coffee. Yeah. Hey, we topped off. <laughs> wow, I think it's a good book. <sighs> uh, thanks. I'll pay you five dollars now. <laughs> so, so end of the end of the age. So we, we keep coming back, and I, I keep trying to point out we're looking at um, timing issues because that's what so much is in dispute more than anything else. Like, uh, when is the timing? You know, and and is is you know we're going to get into eventually the whole fig tree thing? Is that a timing of the end? Uh, how long is a generation? Um, the end of the age, and when is the end of the age? And, and what is that day, or those days, when we read that? So many times in Bible prophecy. So I've got something I want. To, let me hand that out. You got something to hand out? I do have a single page handout. Right. It's you know because I missed Christmas, so this is going to be kind of like a handout. So I, I thought I'd put this together. This is a very brief list of conditions and events of that day of the final generation that we can kind of look at. 
And I do want to continue with Matthew 24, but I thought I'd hand this out first since you could take a look at it. And I want to make sure that you have it in your pause before we get to the end and find out we don't have time. So let's do the Matthew 24 thing and then we will open up some of those chapters just to take a look at them because they do indicate what is included in that time or in those days or in that day or that generation. And we'll see if we can encompass how much that is. Um, so verse 29. Okay, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And what happens then? The sun, sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather, they will gather together. His elect from the four winds and let's see, from one end of the sky to the other. So that's a lot of stuff that happens. And so obviously that's at the end of Great Tribulation. Because it says immediately, immediately, after, after, the immediately after the tribulation of those days. So there's no there's no delay at all. It is just the glorious return. So the other thing to notice here is that it's not just generally a time of trouble or a time of tribulation or trial. A lot of people will say, well, there's trials, there's tribulations all the time. Paul said, you know, we would, you know, we would suffer tribulations and things. Uh, clearly in the text here is mentioning a very specific tribulation because Jesus isn't going to return after every trial, right? Or after every type era of tribulation. He's mentioning a very specific time. So it's immediately after the tribulation of those days. So it's a specific tribulation or trouble at a specific time. And the characteristics of this um, trouble, um, we can read in Jeremiah 30. Uh, that's a very good and a powerful passage. So turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 30. We're just going to kind of read through that real quick and take a look at it. It's very powerful. And there's a lot going on. And it tells us a lot concerning the timing of... Uh, the whole thing? Yeah. It's not too terribly long. And there's a, a lot of good information in here to see. Okay? You going to read it? We're not going to... Um, yeah, I'm going to read it because there's a couple places I'm going to pause. That I want to pause at, so... I do have a couple other passages that I'd like you folks to read. But. Okay, the, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Write all the words which I have spoken to you in a book. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. Okay, so... The Lord says, I will also bring them back to the land that I gave to their forefathers, and they shall possess it. So part of those days, or the days are coming, includes them coming back into the land, right? So it doesn't start at the tribulation. That's in, the tribulation is included, but the days that are coming, that is specifically addresses the end times, is about Israel and Judah. And bringing them back into the land. So that brings us to 1948, right? That's very specific in this passage. Now, these are the words which the Lord spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus says the Lord, I have heard a sound of terror, of dread, and there is no peace. Ask now and see if a male can give birth. Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth? And why have all faces turned pale? So there's a lot of distress going on here. They're just clutching their stomachs and they're just they're in distress and they're screaming out, right? 
Alas, for that day is great. Again, indicating that it's a, that specific time that includes the end time, which includes God bringing Israel back into the land. There is none like it. And it is the time of Jacob's distress that he will be saved from it. So this time starts with the verse 3, bringing Israel and Judah back into the land. And now we've gotten into the tribulation period. Okay, and it is the time of Jacob's distress in verse 7 that he will be saved from it. Jacob's name was changed to what? Israel. Correct, Israel. So this is the time of Israel's distress. So it's a very specific time for Israel. We're talking about Daniel's 70th week. The prophetic clock, as we discussed, for Daniel, or for Israel, that Gabriel gave to Daniel, has stopped. And it's been stopped now for, you know, 2,000 plus years. So, this is the prophetic clocks picking up again. Yes? The Mitchell said that, that God, when he's writing, the Holy Spirit, when he's writing, he uses, generally when somebody's name changes, it's that forward, like, you know, from Saul to Paul, he never calls him Saul again. Except for in this case of Jacob and Israel, when Israel is acting in the flesh, he calls her Jacob. And when she's acting in good, or when he's talking about the covenant with her, then he calls her Israel. So, when he's yeah. talking about the time of Jacob's trouble, obviously, they are not, they're in... Not the, walking in the Lord's will. They yeah, are so he's right. the time of Jacob's trouble, right. so it's the, but yeah, it's still their national name or whatnot, or their mm -hmm. people. Yeah. So that just helped me to understand why, because when you're reading Old Testament, you flip flops very often between the two. Yeah, why does he do that? Well, when you compare, and that's what we do when we study scriptures, if we want to study whether something's a phrase or a word, how it's used. Look at the number of times in the Bible it's used. Make some columns on a paper. Yeah. And you can look up in what context it's used and what the meaning is and what time that meaning might be different and indicate those times and see if there's a pattern there. And it's a very great way to discover some cool things in the scripture rather than just study. Just reading it. Good. Okay, verse 9, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Now here we're, he um, jumped into the millennial kingdom, right? So he kind of mentions the time of distress, the time of Jacob's trouble. He went from 1948 when he said in verse 3 that he's bringing uh, Israel and Judah back into the land, and then he mentions the time of Jacob's trouble. And then in verse 9, he talks about them, uh, David, their king, whom I'm going to raise up for them. So David, the prince, is going to be in the kingdom, um, and he's introducing them to that. Fear not, in verse 10, O Jacob, my servant, declares the Lord, and do not be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar and your offspring from the land of their captivity. And Jacob will return and will be quiet and at ease, and no one will make them afraid. For I am with you, declares the Lord, to save you. For I will destroy completely all the nations where I have scattered you. Only I will not destroy you completely, but I will chasten you justly during the tribulation, right? And will by no means leave you unpunished. Verse 12, for thus says the Lord, your wound is incurable and your injury is serious. There's no one to plead your cause, no healing for your sore, no recovery for you. All your lovers have forgotten you. They did not seek you, for I have wounded you with the wound of an enemy, with the punishment of the cruel one, because your iniquity is great and your sins are numerous. Why do you cry out over your injury? Your pain is incurable because your iniquity is great and your sins are numerous. I have done these things to you. Therefore, all who devour you will be devoured, and all your adversaries, every one of them, will go into captivity. And those who plunder you will, will be for plunder and all who pray upon you, I will give for prey. For I will restore you to health, and I will heal you of your wounds, declares the Lord, because they have called you an outcast, saying, It is Zion. No one cares for her. Okay, this sounds like the time we're living in, and the time of tribulation, and they're punished 
And um, but then the Lord says he's going to restore. So he keeps reiterating, restating this over and over. Um, that says the Lord in verse 18, Behold, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob and have compassion on his dwelling places, and the city will be rebuilt on its ruin. So, and uh, a palace will stand on its rightful place. Now notice the city's rebuilt uh, on its ruin. This is why when I when I get to the that place in the book of Revelation and we go over the timing of the new heaven and new earth, a lot of people will take 2 Peter 3, um, you know, with all the the skies, the heavens rolled up like a scroll and fire and everything, and uh, you know, as if the whole universe is nuked and completely destroyed or whatever, and new heaven and new earth, they'll try to read that as being 2 Peter. Three. Second Peter 3 is talking about judgment and God's anger and fury, yet new heaven and new earth, like this rebuilding of the city of its ruin, uh, there's a type of word for new that has to do with restoration or refreshing, so a renewal, and it, it's the same word that's used of us when uh, we become believers, uh, the Bible describes this as we become a new man. A new woman, you're a new person. God didn't completely destroy you and nuke you and roll you up and recreate you out of whole cloth. You're just renewed. The same thing with the heavens and the earth. And this here kind of kind of um, adds commentary to that. And the city will be rebuilt on its ruin, and the palace will stand on its rightful place. Um, but we'll get into that some more absolutely when we get there. I think it's kind of interesting, and there's some good reasons for it. But just think about that for a while. And as you're reading through Revelation, try to keep that in the back of your mind. From them will proceed thanksgiving and the voice of those who celebrate, and I will multiply them, and they will not be diminished. I will also honor them, and they will not be insignificant. The children also will be as formerly, and their congregations shall be established before me, and I will punish all their oppressors. All their oppressors, their leader shall be one of them, and their ruler shall come forth from the midst. And I will bring him near, and will he will approach me? For who would dare to risk his life to approach me? Declares the Lord. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Behold, the tempest of the Lord. Wrath has gone forth. So that period he was describing his wrath. A sweeping temp tempest, it will be, it will burst on the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has performed and until he has accomplished the intent of his heart. In the latter days, and again, another emphasis of when these, those days are, these days, you will understand this. So they, and they will understand it in the latter days. It's coming upon them soon, right? So, I hope you see why I decided that's a, just a really vital and excellent chapter to read that encompasses and shows us um, that final generation, that final period, and how long it is and where it covers. And verse 3, Israel coming into the land, and then later on he restates a couple of times tribulation that you will be punished, but I will cure you and I will establish you going into the millennial kingdom. So is that a great chapter or what? It's very moving. Um, so the question comes in will any escape um, read Revelation 3.10 and you find that, that we do who, who wants to read Revelation 3.10 what does it say we got a couple verses and then if somebody grab 1 Thessalonians 5.3 310? Yes, please. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So, as we emphasized before, the passage says there's a time of trial or tribulation that's going to fall upon the whole world. It 
Jesus was going to keep his people from it. We just saw in Jeremiah 30 that it is a time of wrath. And he mentions his, his wrath uh, in a couple different ways there. Who has got First Thessalonians? I can't talk tonight. What is my name? First Thessalonians 5.3. For when they say peace and safety, then suddenly destruction comes upon them and labor, labor as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So, as we've read before, I want to emphasize again, is there's a lot of, uh, but you, but them, but us, and we, and they. So, there's a lot of what's going to happen to them, but you kind of a deal. So Paul emphasizes what's going to happen. Some people are going to escape clearly in this text is that this stuff's going to happen to them. Um, who wants to read 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18? Lord there. Oh, she just threw you under the bus. <laughs> she backed up the car. Back to Matthew and she, yeah. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if you believe what that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. So we can see that some do escape. And that will be believers, right? Can you take a quick look at this? Throw chapter 5, verse 9 in there, please. Hmm. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Sometimes people want to say, you just want to escape. That's all. Well, yeah. Is <laughs> something wrong with that? You know, yeah. Uh, you don't? No. <laughs> you don't know, want to escape? Come on. So how do we get 70 AD out of that as some type of a conclusive timing? Um, it just doesn't, you know, it bothers the mind, in my opinion. So we'll go back to Matthew 24 now. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, like this big meteor shower, right? And the heavens will be shaken. I do not know what that means. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with great power and glory. Um, so, heaven's shaken. I'm not sure. Let's look at a couple more verses. Oh, no. Gonna... What verses are we in Matthew? We were in Matthew. Okay, sorry. You gave me the first Did you? I did. I want to look at, if we can, I'll give you these verses and I can flip to them real quick since I've got this funky cell phone thing going on here. Um, Isaiah 13, 9 and 10. I can do Isaiah. You can do Isaiah 13, 9 and 10? Okay. Okay. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. 
For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. There's more Old Testament passages that demonstrate the same thing Jesus said here. He's kind of also in the, uh, Ezekiel 32, um, 7 and 8, I've got that right here. It says, And when I extinguish you, I will cover the heavens and darken their stars. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon will not give its light. All the shining lights in the heavens I will darken over you, and will set darkness on your land, declares the Lord God. I tend to think God is capable of snuffing out the sun if he wants to, I, but really the timing of what's going on is there's great cataclysm in the earth. If you've been like in a neighborhood or an area where there's this big massive fire going on, or there's been maybe a volcano, I remember 1980, Mount St. Helens when it blew and I was living out west. And the sun does get muted and turn gray, the moon turns blood red because of all the ash and smoke in the air. So we're, we're dealing with um, astronomical cataclysms here of meteor showers happening and volcanic activity in the very end, all these things are described, especially when you get to the bowl judgments at the very end of the book of Revelation. Um, there's all kinds of earthquakes kicking up dust into the air and so that with volcanic activity, I believe that when we read here in Ezekiel, what we see is the Lord sending clouds to extinguish him and darken him. Not that necessarily, though he could do it, that he's dimming the sun or whatever, muting the moon. If he dimmed the sun or darkened the, moon, the sun completely, the moon would give no light because the moon gets its light from the sun, right? So I just think it's uh, symptoms of what is going to be going on in the world as a result of God's judgment, his wrath upon the earth. Um, I'll go real quick to Joel 2. Joel 2, I'm going to look at, uh, let's look at verse 10. I'll, I'll hop, skip, and jump a couple over here. But we won't read through the whole thing. Um, doo -doo -doo. Before them, the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and, moon, and the moon grow dark, and the stars lose their brightness. And then to, if we go up to uh, verse 31, this is a longer chapter, so I'm not reading the whole chapter. It's interesting to read. I re you should read, Joel, when you get an opportunity. But, um, well, verse 30 says, I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Um, the great and awesome day of the Lord is going to be judgment, right? It's going to be like the sheep and the goats judgment at the end of the tribulation. And uh, when Jesus comes down, it's the grapes of wrath. And he's going to be you know, wreaking havoc on all the nations of the world. People who rejected him and were attacking Israel, his land. It, it, Joel 3, let's look at a verse there real quick. 3.15 says, okay, let's start with verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon grow dark and the stars lose their brightness. Um, there's a lot there to read, and you should read that. Just read the whole book, whole, all of Joel if you want, and then read some judgment. Uh, it's, it's not going to be pretty. You don't want to, wouldn't want to be on the earth in, in those days. Um, I'm going to look at, real quick, too. I'll refer to Amos. Amos 8. Um, verse 9. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and will make the earth dark in broad daylight. Then I will turn your festivals in the morning, and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on everyone's loins, and baldness on every head. That sounds like something radioactive going on, doesn't it? And I will make it 
like a time of mourning for an only son, and the end of it will be like a bitter day. And that's end of verse 10. So, we already read about the sign of the Son of uh, Man coming in, in Revelation 19. We already kind of took a look at it in the sky. The tribes of the earth will mourn. Um, what, what is that? Revelation, Revelation 1 7. Remember that one? This all describes the things Jesus is saying is going to happen at the end. And one of the things is going to be the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds, coming in the sky, right? Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. So that's the second coming, and that's how everybody's going to be reacting. That's going to be the conditions of the world at that time. Questions so far? It's pretty clear how it's going to be, right? It's going to be kind of ugly, kind of grim. If that's his, his point here. Yeah, I want to see it. Yeah, well, yeah, I want to see it too. Yeah. So a great trumpet for the angels to gather together his elect. Also in verse 31. Now notes, notice that this is after this is an after event. Right? Matthew 24. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. So him gathering his elect is at the end of the tribulation. So we've got this tribulation period here. The believers, the bride of Christ, the church is all raptured right here at the beginning, right? And then you go through the tribulation, you begin the tribulation week here. Great tribulation starts right here in the middle, right? And that's when things get really horrible. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, so after, there's a gathering of the elect. Now what elect would that be? Yeah. Like say it could be Israel and some Gentiles too, because there'll be Gentile believers too. So if any of the believers, the elect are any of the believers. That's not the bride. That's not the bride. So tribulation saints, you could say. Okay. So they're all going to be gathered. And then at the end here we kind of discussed it and we'll we'll get into it. We'll actually Matthew 25 and in the Olivet Discourse Part 2 <laughs> that few people read. Matthew 25 is going to be the sheep and goats judgment. And that's where actually he ends up gathering everybody to. So. Um, so only the chosen ones, though, are gathered in this particular after event that's going to be going on where the angels gather them all and they blow the horns and the chosen ones or the elect are gathered. They're gathered to be entered, entered into the millennial kingdom. Um, we see that in Revelation 20 verse 4. How is that? Uh, so he's come back and we're with him. And then they're they're gathered after that point. Yeah. Okay. Because we return with him. Yeah. What exactly, how exactly that looks, I don't know. It, when you get into Revelation 21, yeah. <clears throat> the narrative there is um, we see New Jerusalem and the angels out there in the heavens. In fact, the one with one of the bowls is still out there, okay? And he's telling John, he says, Behold the bride, now wife of Christ. So that's us at, at, at the um, now, beginning of the millennium. Israel is already the bride of God. So how does the that wife happen? of Israel, yes. Yes. It's another story. So now we're the wife of Jesus and they're the wife of God. Okay. Yeah. I'm just, okay. So Israel. 
We can give that eventually. Oh, that's like a. And there's where you lost it. There you go. Yeah, it's over. Um, if you look real quick, we don't have to go to Revelation yet because we're going to be there eventually anyway, but 24. It, it kind of corresponds because remember, there's like 13 times in the chapter Jesus mentions the end and then the end, the end, the second coming, the end, because he's emphasizing that this is what this all this information is about because that's answering your questions about what is all this supposed to be. And not all of it is, happens in the end. Some of it is a, a foreshadowing of the end because prophecy very much, um, much of the time, is about near and far fulfillments. So we see this repeatedly. So we see a foreshadowing of the end of the world in some of these events. We do see some of that in 70 AD. But it takes us to a point and then it, it stops where things don't happen to where um, we don't see the abomination of desolation. We don't see the mark of the beast. We definitely do not see angels coming and gathering people up, and we definitely do not see the sign of the coming of the Son of Man in the sky in 70 AD, right? Even though that happens immediately after. So what that was is 70 AD is kind of a foreshadowing. And also what we see Jesus say about the very end is that during this time of tribulation, there will never have been anything before it that has ever been so bad. That means World War I or World War II. Okay? 70 AD wasn't even as bad as either of the World Wars. If we want to take a look at just those two. Um, that include Israel. You know, if we're going to look at, okay, what's, what's bad for Israel? World War I and World War II were bad, but this time Jesus says, though we'll never have been, speaking of the Great Tribulation, really, anything so bad before or after. So that dates this as future event. Because we end up World War I just this uh, generation ago, right? World War II generation is still alive, a few of them. Um, yet this will be the worst thing, worse than that. Okay, so that clearly points out that this has got to be future from what Jesus said. There's really no escaping that. 70 AD couldn't have been that. Okay, so anyway, he's talking about the end several times in this chapter as we've gone over to death. Verse 22, unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Um, some translations say those days will be shortened, right? There are some groups out there, some people out there who say, well, look, God's going to shorten the days. Maybe they'll only be like 20-hour days or 10-hour days. What's going to, ooh, there's going to be something going on there. No, no, no. He cuts it short by coming back. Because left to our own devices at Armageddon, if we kept going with Armageddon and all the weapons they bring and everybody into the Valley of Megiddo, it would have destroyed the whole world. Everybody would be dead. And game over, man. So those days are cut short by the coming of the Son of Man, verse 22. Sorry, I had to throw that in there. You know, cultural reference. You got to do those every once in a while. Uh, yeah, aliens. Well, I haven't seen it. She hasn't been there. Well, he's a funny actor in that movie, I'll tell you what. So, Revelation 20 answers more completely. Revelation 20 answers more completely as a parenthetical the disposition of all the players in the world stage. At the tween point between the tribulation and the millennium and beyond. So if we could take a quick look at it, we may as well take a look at Revelation 20. Well, if you're going there, I mean, what the heck? We may as well. It's just right around the corner. We're about to see the world live it out. So we may as well go there. So in my humble opinion, 
Revelation 20 is a parenthetical. You can, you can experiment with this if you want in one way, and that is sometime make a note to read Revelation 19 about the end, the second coming, and all this stuff we just looked at. Okay, and the grapes of wrath and all that stuff that happens in judgment. Skip Revelation 20 and then jump into Revelation 21. And it flows nicely. And you all just have to try it sometime. Why, why Revelation 20? Why would it be a parenthetical? Because the question naturally comes up. Um, so we've got perform signs in his presence. We've got the mark of the beast, and they're thrown in. And then uh, those two, the Antichrist and the false prophet, are, are thrown into the lake of fire, and uh, which burns brimstone in the verse 21. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds of the uh, were filled with their flesh. So that's, you know, the eagles gathered. But you're going to go, wait, wait a minute, what all happened? What happens to the believers? Wait, what happens to Satan then? Satan does not go in there in the lake of fire, just the Antichrist and the false. So these questions are naturally going to pop up in your mind. What happens to everybody? Wait, wait, wait. You know, so John in here, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, goes in and, and talks about the disposition of different people groups. So he says, okay, fall back and breathe. This is what's going to happen. So then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss with a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, making it real clear what the imagery is here, right? That way there's no questioning. Sometimes there is symbolism and word pictures in the Bible, but usually it'll clarify and tell you in the text what it's talking about. In this case, it's not an exception. Uh, he's the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. Um, some people will try to say a thousand years just means a really long time. Well, that's not super important. I mean, if you want to do that, that's fine. Um, I think thousand means thousands. We have nothing in the text to tell us why it would mean anything other than thousand. Okay? And he threw them into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until, well, look, there's an expiration to the really long time. Until the thousand years were completed. Do you complete a general open ended really long time? You don't usually complete it, do you? There's a there's a an appointed time when it's completed. So at the end of a thousand years it's completed. After these things he must be released for a short time. And then he says, Then I saw um, thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony, these are martyrs, right, of Jesus, and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received a mark on their foreheads or on their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This shows us that we're talking about the in-between time. That's what happens to the believers who didn't cave. These were believers, and they didn't cave. These are the ones who didn't get the mark. This is what happens to them. So they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. You know, who's left that would not have come to life? The only ones that did not get mentioned yet are, are who? Any guesses? Yeah. Mostly, yeah, like up to, yeah, the the dead unbelievers, the ones who are already dead. They, any, any unbelievers who are dead, they don't get resurrected yet. Because when they do get resurrected, they won't get a glorified body. They'll have an eternal body, but it will be for damnation, right? And they're not, uh, so they, their resurrection does not happen yet, okay? Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection, the dead who are raised later on, who are unbelievers, that's the second resurrection. It's a classification. It's not an order of events. Right? Because the first resurrection, well, there have been plenty of people resurrected before the end of the tribulation, hasn't there? Not just Jesus. 
and other people Jesus raised himself and so forth. So there's two classifications. First class and second class. And so second resurrection, you know, that's coach. Coach is hell. <laughs> so all right, so the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ will reign over or will reign with him for a thousand years. Where am I here? Oh, verse 7. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, which is an idiom for all of the world, right? The world is not a cube. That's on because it means it's also not a round flat earth disk either, is it? So, Gog... Um, Gog and Magog to gather them together for war. The number of them was like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. That's how the light Gog and Magog is good. So once again, they're coming up against Jerusalem. It's like they did before. Except this time Jesus is among their number, right? So instead of Gog and Magog ending like it did in Ezekiel 38 and 39 where there's fire and hail and all this stuff and then bodies and all this. This is fire comes down in, um, in a moment and devours them. Verse 10, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone finally. Where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw the great white throne, and uh, him who sat upon it from the presence of the earth, and heaven and earth fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. The, the sea gave up their dead, etc., etc., and death and Hades are thrown in there as well. So it's Chapter 20, you can see, I hope, the reason why I think it's a parenthetical just to describe the different people groups, the different players on the world stage, and what happens to them. Then the narrative will continue in chapter 21. Um, because you see in chapter, in verse 2, I saw the holy city of New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Well, we're, New Jerusalem's our home, and it's identified with us. That's why the angel says, identified if it is the bride, now wife of Christ. It's because when you talk about Jerusalem, you're talking about God's holy people in that city. You talk about New Jerusalem, you're talking about God's people associated with it. So New Jerusalem, are we going to be waiting up there in heaven waiting to come down to earth at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ? Or are we returning with him at the second coming? The answer that's easy because we already read in the scriptures that repeatedly, again, we'll go into this in some detail, but we return with Christ. So New Jerusalem coming down, new heaven, and new earth is at the beginning of the millennium because new means renewal. Jesus is going to have to renew it. You know, you've got 100 pound hail, every island sunk, every mountain's flattened. Um, you got Armageddon going on. You got all these dead bodies everywhere. That's not a really happy kingdom for us to just say, okay, guys, make yourselves at home. Jesus is going to have to do a restoration, a refreshing of the earth. And if he does it, he's not going to do it halfway, right? So he's going to redo it. And at some point in here, too, Jesus said, um, Lo, I make all things new. So he is making all things new. And he made everything originally. And six days before, so he can do this in no time. So that is where we are so far in Matthew 24 with getting into um, the end of the age and what it looks like at the end of the age. And really, we've just started that. We've just spent an hour on that. If you want, We can take a look at this, but first let's open it up for questions. Now, are there any questions about what we covered? Because we kind of, in 
as Speed Zoo kind of a way just flew through how Jesus describes the tribulation, the great tribulation, and going into the millennium. No questions? Okay. We all are great students. What I do encourage you to do, though, is look for those terms. We can discuss this in more detail next time. Um, but sometime this week, read Ezekiel 36, 37, and 38. And the reason why is because particularly about Israel and God, what it looks like when God brings them back into the land. Now there's a difference between God bringing them back into the land and then possessing the whole land, which would be the complete fulfillment, which does not happen to the millennium. But remember, there's a restoration for Israel. They've been scattered upon the earth, and God brings them back out of the nations, and that's the promise. And just like Jeremiah 30, because that's part of the promise of that final generation that's part of the end that Jeremiah 30 describes. It includes everything from bringing Israel back in the land into time of punishment and judgment for them and whatever, but restoring them and bringing them into the, that's all part of that same period. So um, you will see the same pattern in Ezekiel. 36, 37 is the valley of dry bones. Can these bones be made to live? So it's the whole thing about Israel coming back in the land and God restoring them. And then chapter 38 takes us in, I believe, into the moment and that tribulation, rather, because it mentions wrath. And we get the Gog and the Gog war. And God says, my wrath and my great wrath, this is what I've done. And he starts judging the nations by bringing them against Israel. And then he judges them on the mountains outside of Israel. So with that, uh, I guess if you have any more questions, we can discuss it afterwards. But we'll conclude this study and we'll pick up the rest because we are not done yet with Matthew 24. And I think some of the really cool stuff, like as in the days of Noah, which is kind of where we started off here, um, is yet to come. There'll still be some great and awesome stuff to look at to look at how we can date that with where we're at now compared to where it lands in the future in the whole timeline. Okay? So let's close real quick in prayer. Lord, the time seems to fly by so quickly when we get into your word. And um, I, I hate to sound rushed, but at the same time, um, it's just, it, it can be frustrating not getting through all the material that we want to get through, but we want to understand all this and understand what you're doing. So many um, mistaken notions can come out of this without a careful reading. And Lord, we know that you're the author of all, that uh, all scripture, and that we have to use synthesis and, and pull in other verses that inform the same material so that we can get proper context and understand the timing of things and, and what you're doing and not just isolate verses or passages here and there. So God, we we ask that you give, them, give us wisdom here and give us understanding, give us clarity as we're reading and, uh, and reading more chapters throughout the week. And we pray that you, um, now that New Year's is, is here and, and getting past us, bring everybody back together, each and every one, next week. And we look forward to um, an enjoyable time in the Word and a good time in fellowship. In Christ's name we pray and give you thanks. Amen.